Are you the kind of person that forgets somebody's name right after you hear it? Do you read a bunch of fun and interesting facts on the internet and can't seem to remember any of them after a day of scrolling? The strategy to fix these issues is simpler than you'd think. At the end of the video, I'll talk about how this can work even if you have or think you have ADHD. So stay tuned. Space retention is a skill that you can use to fix many of your memory issues and has been replicated by psychologists several times since Ebbinghaus discovered and researched the strategy in 1885. Through his experiments, he found that even after just 20 minutes, we can forget as much as 50% of what we have just learned or experienced. What did you have for breakfast this morning? How about two days ago? A question so simple may have been difficult to recall because this memory likely wasn't programmed in your brain in an effective way. Here's how it works. After first learning or experiencing something that you'd like to remember, seal it in your brain with a few repetitions of it right away. Nick, Mike, Jennifer, Anthony. Even with this initial practice, these names may fall out of your memory as quickly as a few minutes. After 20 minutes or so, do another round of practice. Nick, Mike, Jennifer, Anthony. If you're notoriously bad at putting names to faces, you may have to squeeze this round of practice in faster than that 20 minutes. Do several rounds of practice and gradually increase the time you put in between the practice rounds. For example, after 20 minutes after your first round, in between rounds you may wait an hour, then two hours, four hours, seven hours, 12 hours, 18 hours, etc. The more rounds that you do, the longer these names will stay in your memory. It's simple, practice makes permanent. The applications of this strategy are limitless. If you want to be the master of fun internet facts, make a list and review them on a staggered schedule. Bringing up the facts in conversation, if you do it accurately, counts as a practice round. Studying for a hard exam that requires you to know a lot? Don't cram, do shorter and more frequent studying periods in a staggered fashion to get more efficient at studying. You'll remember it better and won't have to spend as much time with your face in your books. Memory is a really tricky and often misunderstood concept. Let's look at some of the facts combined with good logic to investigate why so many people have bad memory, why some memories stick better than others, why this strategy works so well, and why so many people are reporting that they have attention deficit issues. Opposed to common belief, your brain is not a computer that can pull out information at any given time. What we typically refer to as memory is not anything more than a behavior. It's recalling a certain fact, experience, or idea. When referring to memory, many people refer to either short-term or long-term memory. We might conceptualize these concepts by how well this space retention method is being used. One thing that I wanted to add that didn't make it into the initial recording is typically when you're remembering something, you're remembering the last time you recall that event or idea or whatever it is, and not necessarily the original event. All right, on to some examples. Let's say you're solving a difficult story math problem with several different components. You read the prompt several times, get your pencil out to work with the problem, and eventually you solve it. During that process, you are getting many repetitions of the pieces of information in short succession, putting them into your short-term memory. However, if you aren't repeating these components of the problem to yourself at a later time, you may forget some or all of them fairly quickly. In other words, you didn't have the space repetition practice to have these memories coded into your long-term memory, making them rather forgettable. Any behavior, including memory recall, occurs when two main conditions are present a trigger for the behavior, and enough reinforcement for this behavior in the past to evoke that response. When practicing something on your own, reinforcement for the behavior can occur automatically by the answer you give being correct. Think about learning via flashcards. You are given a trigger for the behavior, for example, the word to define or the question to answer. You take your guess before looking at the answer, then you look at the actual answer and see how well your answer matched up. If there is a solid match, then boom, reinforcement occurs and that behavior becomes more likely under that trigger. It's almost like exercise for your brain. That practice rep will make it more difficult to forget. If there isn't a match, it may take some more rigorous retraining because your trigger is currently evoking the wrong response out of your memory. When this happens and you don't take it hard and or don't practice the connection between the trigger and the correct response, you're more prone to make the same error again than if you would have practiced the correct connection. Again, practice makes permanent, even if it's wrong. When I'm studying and make an error, 
I'll go back and forth repeatedly and try to install the correct connection between question and answer. But what about memory recall when there's a less clear trigger than a flashcard? Think about all the times that you have said or heard someone else say, this reminded me of blank. Undoubtedly, there's some connection between what they recently experienced and what that individual was about to recall if you investigate it. Let's say a person was telling a story about when they were lost at an amusement park as a child and were separated from their parents for hours. This may have evoked a memory from the listener about when they were lost at the mall due to the similarity of circumstances. Whether they choose to share this memory or not depends on their history of whether they've received a reinforcing reaction for sharing such a memory with that person or kind of person. If someone mentions that they always used to suck at math in school, this may make the listener recall what they sucked at in school or perhaps even just something that they're bad at in general. Triggers for memory recall don't need to be verbal either. Many people have a particular food or song that they associate with a special memory. When exposed to a similar aroma of that food or that song later on in life, these things could trigger the recall behavior of that special memory. Sometimes a memory can be strong despite only having a few repetitions. Though there is some speculation here, I believe this occurs when there is a strong biological response to that scenario, such as increased adrenaline, dopamine, or oxytocin, aka the love hormone. This chemical response makes the feelings of that memory much more intense, causing them to be recalled more easily and by a wider variety of things. For example, your special memory paired with a song or smell may also occur when thinking about the people who were there more than one trigger for the memory. When there are many triggers for a memory, especially about an emotionally intense scenario, you become more likely to practice recalling this memory because there are more things that trigger it. This can naturalistically program the space retention practicing and put these memories into what many would call your long-term memory. I would argue that it is unnecessary to think about these memories as being physical things in your brain, but simply behaviors that are more likely to occur under a wider variety of conditions. No scientist, despite using any existing tool or brain scan, has the ability to see specific memories in the brain. Until we have such technology, I think it's best to understand them in the simplest conceptualization that we have that works. If you have ADHD, will these methods still work? Absolutely. ADHD is not something that can be pinpointed in the brain either. It's diagnosed via observed and reported behavior. Oftentimes, individuals with ADHD will seek out stimulation that provides quick dopamine, and they learn that if they constantly flip their attention to different things, they can maintain their brain feeding them those hits of dopamine rapidly. Dopamine is one of the neurotransmitters that is responsible for reinforcement. In other words, the continuation of behavior. By default, people seek the path of least resistance towards these dopamine hits. Attention issues are becoming more prevalent in American society, partly because we have access to so many things that can provide these quick hits of dopamine on our phones and the internet. Each tweet read, every insta pic or reel consumed, every text, TikTok, Reddit post read, and more, provides a quick hit of dopamine readily available at the touch of our fingers. We often don't practice to retain the information from these sources, we just go to the next thing that provides that stimulation quickly. By having this massive amount of content available, it often prevents us from practicing the space repetition method of memory retention. Although I don't plan to solve your attention issues in this video, if it's something you'd like to change, you have to start by changing your habits. You need to change how you consume content, how you use your phone, and continue to practice the space retention method. Would you like to hear more detail about this in a future video? Post in the comments if you'd enjoy that, and perhaps I'll prioritize it better on the list of future videos I'd like to make. Bad memory is something that we all have the power to work on and get better at. Instead of being doomed by labeling yourself as someone who has a bad memory or has attention issues, use a strategy to get better at it. You are a person who can have better memory, but you are so much more. Check out my video, Who Are You? if you'd like to learn more about that. Until next time, peace.